Welcome to Talk Mental Health with Logan Noon. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, I would greatly appreciate if you give it a rating on whatever you're listening to. This will help increase the rankings on the category of mental health and fitness and help other listeners reach this podcast. Thank you for tuning in. All right, so I am talking with Anna. Um, welcome to Talk Mental Health with Logan Noon. Thank you for Hi, agreeing Logan. to come on. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this was kind of a cool cool way that you got on this podcast you wrote like this really thoughtful um awesome email to me like uh you know you live with bipolar disorder and you you found this podcast and stumbled upon it and you know getting those type of emails is is it really makes the podcast all worth it you know i i was looking at like kind of the stats of the podcast and it's been really nice to like see the podcast grow but you know getting those type of emails just is so much better and so much it just makes me it, it really makes me feel honored and, and feel like I'm actually doing something to help people. Um, so thank you so much for reaching out um, and, and be willing to come on this podcast. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. So I'll tell you why I did. Um, because I go to therapy, obviously, and um, had been talking to my therapist about the importance of, so a little bit of background too. I'm a pre-med post-bac student, so I have a degree in psychology. I'm an EMT also. I worked as an EMT for, uh, I've been an EMT for about a year and a half now, um, and that's what I'm still doing during my um, post-bac program. But uh, as I'm going into the medical world, I'm realizing more and more there's not a huge community of physicians or pre-med or med students who are living with mental health diagnoses, at least openly. Yeah. And I think, I think because, well, first of all, I mean, it's stigmatized in general in life. And then when you get into hyper competitive performance centered med school, it's like, nobody wants to talk about it. So my thing was I have these days and this is what I wrote in my email to you too. Like I have days where I'm like, I'm on meds, I go to therapy, I take my wellness really seriously, and I manage my illness really well, but I still have days that are shitty, Mm -hmm. like they, you just do still, and so during those times, when I sit down to study, and I'm like, well, my mental health is shit today, I can't, I just can't today, and I have times where I'm like, well, can I even do this, can I be a physician if I have days where I just I just can't and I need to take a step back and it gets, and then I get sucked into the negative thinking and everything. But um, my therapist really encouraged me to try to reach out and find people who were doing it with mental health diagnoses. And particularly in my case, I'm diagnosed with bipolar too. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was like, well, I don't, know of any and I was like oh I remember scrolling through Dr. Ryan Gray's podcast uh his pre-med years podcast Mm -hmm. and seeing the word bipolar in one of the titles and like almost dropping my phone because I was like oh my god this doesn't get talked about in this setting so that's how I found you and then just hearing about your story and everything and how candid you are about and how it's like you're candid but it's it's not even because you're like, Oh, I'm trying to do it's like, yeah, because there's no other way to be. Yeah. And I just love that so freaking much. And that's mm-hmm. how I'm really trying to I have been looking for a physician who lives openly with bipolar disorder and haven't found one. So I'm like, God damn it, I guess I have to go be that physician now. So that's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to become more transparent about it and um yeah, find people like you who are already doing that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's fantastic. And thanks again for, for reaching out. And, you know, I want to help you however I can. And, you know, I've, I've gotten a couple other emails very similar to this. Um, mm-hmm. And so I hope kind of our conversation today can help more people that are in our shoes, because how I just look at it is they estimate roughly about 4% of the United States population has bipolar disorder. Um, like one in four people have mental illness, you know, it's a lot of people, but you're right. Not a lot of physicians or other medical professionals talk about it openly. 
Um, and then once you get to medical school, you realize everyone has mental health shit going on. But yeah. It's just so stressful and so intense. Um, you know, and there's definitely good days, bad days, but you know, I still have those kind of days, but I think everybody does. And mm -hmm. I've definitely learned techniques that have helped um, me throughout this process. But so how, how can I best help you? Like what questions I guess do you have? So first of all, you went through, do I, am I remembering correctly? You went through, like you finished school and then you went back to do pre-med or had yeah. you, yeah. Okay. So I am remembering that correctly. I didn't want to be like, yeah, you would did that. Um, so were you, when you first started that pre-med post back journey, what kind of headspace were you in? Were you diagnosed, treated, feeling pretty solid going into it? Yeah, I mean, I was, so I guess when I was in your shoes, or maybe I guess even a little before that, um, I was working still in like finance and insurance um, in various roles. At first, I was like kind of an analyst working behind a computer the whole time. And then I worked more as a salesman. Um, but either way, I was not very good at it. Um, but I think I wasn't very good at it because I just didn't care. I just hated yeah. it. Um, and it wasn't fun. I dragged ass every morning and I just felt so, so, so depressed. And at that time, um, I was working kind of on weekends and nights, um, just like maybe a couple times a month, but I was doing like speaking engagements where I would share my story of bipolar disorder. And that really solidified for me, like, okay, I want to work in this industry. And I didn't exactly mm -hmm. know what that even meant. But I was considering either becoming a therapist or taking a more medicine approach. And then I really didn't have too much. I didn't really care if I ended up as a nurse practitioner or a physician, to be honest, because I didn't I didn't think that there was huge, huge differences in what my day to day life would be. I just wanted to help connect with people and help be a provider and, and just, yeah, help people that were in similar situations to, to both of us. So I remember kind of a vivid conversation um, with my parents where I decided I wanted to go back to school and, and do all this. And I kind of, you know, I remember making this big spreadsheet and realizing if I went a nurse practitioner route, it, it was going to be a little bit shorter, but not by a hell of a lot, maybe yeah. one or two years. And so I kind of was just like, you know what, I... I kind of want to shoot for the moon here and just see what happens. And if I don't get into medical school, then so be it. And I'll go be a nurse practitioner, a PA. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to be, you know, my life would be over, but I didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was, I was in a good headspace because it was, it was very challenging financially because I was going from working in finance to trying to figure out how the hell I was going to, you know, beef up my resume and take classes on the side. So that was kind of the, the, some of the stresses that I was dealing with. But I remember being in an extremely good headspace because it felt exciting. It felt like I was chasing something that I was really passionate about. And in many ways, it kind of was like I was dealing with hypomania. Um, mm -hmm. like almost like, Oh, I'm very pain. familiar. Yeah. And so for, <laughs> for the listeners who don't know what that really means, it's almost like a mini manic episode. But it's always, it's sometimes very productive. Um, yeah. And I remember just feeling very excited. Um, and then it kind of eventually led to some stress in, in, because I was putting so much effort into school. You know, I knew I needed to do extremely well, um, but I also wanted to pay the bills. So it was like I was working between school and work like 70 or 80 hours a week. And that was incredibly stressful, but not bad stress, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely feel like, especially I was only out for a year. And like I said, I've been working as an EMT, which I do love. I just, so I couldn't see myself doing it for, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years. But I feel like the hardest part about going back and making that career change is like the really mundane stuff. Like, uh, well, I have to pay my cell phone bill, you know, <laughs> like, well, I'm going to be in class though for this. So it was like the mundane, like day to day. Well, I have to pay my bills still. I have to like take my dogs out. It was, it was like the mundane transition mm -hmm. of having to deal with. It. So yeah, that's interesting you say that. So you were um, 
in treatment, felt ready to take something on like that? Like you felt good about it? I mean, good in some regard. It's, it's, you know, some, there's so many people that apply to medical school and never get in. Right. And so I was very nervous that I might be barking up a tree that I, you know, and I would never really achieve this goal and pissing away money, but I wanted to gamble and it felt very, very exciting to me. And, you know, it was, I was very thankful because at that time in my life, I met this wonderful woman who I eventually ended up marrying. Um, and she was very encouraging. She was like, you know, you, you leave, she met me when I was still working in insurance. And she's like, you leave for insurance every day and you hate it. And, you know, as soon as the clock would hit five, I would run out the door. I refused to stay late. I just hated it so much. And she's like, that's a horrible way to live. So and true. so, yeah. you know, it, it, the although there was of course a lot of financial stressors it I finally felt good about the path I was going down yeah it's cool that you bring up your wife too because that's a, been a really big um and this is part of the reason I reached out to you honestly is this whole idea of like fortifying and building community and building community that um integrates these things that are important to me so like mental health medicine this and that and um i've been really trying to explore that in different ways too like i went to my first group therapy session mm -hmm. this past week and that's something i would have never done if i didn't start thinking about like community in this really deep way and be like reaching out to you going to group therapy um starting a podcast with my friend who has depression like doing these things where suddenly I'm talking about it. And even today, this morning, I had coffee with one of my best friends who I hadn't seen in several weeks. And I realized she's one of my closest friends and I had never talked to her about being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and I was like, you know, I just started this podcast. <laughs> and she was like, cool, what's it about? And I was like, um, well, I have bipolar disorder and blah, blah, blah. And we talk about suicide. It's pretty heavy. We talk about suicidality, but we try to make it fun. And she just texted me after I left and was like, thank you so much. I'm listening to it now. And I just want to say thank you so much for talking about suicide because I've had five friends who have died by suicide. Yeah. I, I knew about one but she had never even felt comfortable, like even talking about the fact that she had five, that is so mm -hmm. many. And she said every single one, when it would happen, um, in every case, we were like, oh my God, what, why didn't they talk to me about it? They were, yeah. they seemed so happy. Why didn't they come to me and, and talk about it? And, um, I told, I was like, well, that's like kind of become my new mission. It's like, why aren't we, why didn't they? It's not because it doesn't say anything about you. It doesn't mean you are a bad friend or they like didn't feel comfortable. It's this kind of deep underlying thing that I think is really tied to the way that we build communities around mental health care and around having these conversations. So that's uh, community has been a really big focus of mine lately mm -hmm. and trying to build it even for people who aren't diagnosed with anything. It's so important to be kind of in that, that support framework too for people. Mm -hmm. well, and everyone I, has mental health. I mean, when I was living in Sacramento, it was, you know, I just think kind of the luck of the trade that I was living in a fairly decent sized city that I was attending. Um, it, there was no professional there, no like trained therapist or anything, but it was a weekly bipolar and depression support group and it kind of was every mental illness really was fine showing up but you know I, I really enjoyed that and that kind of gave me the confidence to go down this road because there was actually a, a couple doctors in the group but the doctors refused to tell any of their they at least didn't live publicly about it maybe they told some of their closest colleagues but they wow they kind of advised me like oh no don't live openly about it you know you can't you won't get into medical school if, if, you know, that's the kind of thing. Um, and quite frankly, that it might've partially been true. You know, I applied mm -hmm. to 30 something schools and I got into one. 
Oh um, my God. I remember it being over 20. I remember yeah. when I was listening to Dr. Gray's podcast about you talking and he was really negative about you or not. I mean, not negative, but he warned strongly against. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just like, it sucks. It sucks when people are like, don't, well, I <laughs> don't mean, talk I, about it. I don't necessarily think it's bad advice because it's not when, when you, I don't know how close you are exactly to applying, but when you start formulating your personal statement, you have to be very mindful in how you discuss it, you mm -hmm. know, because woe is me. I have bipolar disorder is, I don't know if going to have the same effect as saying like, I'm going to be a better physician because I have bipolar disorder. Right. Right. And that was kind of the approach I took. And, you know, I want my patients to feel comfortable knowing that, that I am a colleague in a sense, and I've lived similar experiences to them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I also have to realize that there's going to be some of my future patients that may look at me as lesser of a physician or incompetent or that my judgment is skewed because I have bipolar disorder. And it's just, there, there, there's going to be a price you pay. And sometimes it's going to create better relationship with your patients, but also it's possible that it could create worse. And right. it's just, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Did you do a post back program or did you just go back and like take the classes? I decided to just take the classes at a community college. Okay. Um, simply because I thought it, it, it was cheaper. Um, you know, and I think there's pros and cons to doing it both ways, but yeah, I just did it the community college route. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm in a, in a post back program. So, um, it kind of, takes a little bit of the application personal statement pressure off because I've already done the interviewing because they have an assured admission um, agreement. Okay. So as long as you finish with this GPA and this MCAT score or whatever, you have assured admission, but oh wow. um, okay. yeah, so it's, it's awesome. Um, but I'm, I am still really trying to navigate the way that I'm going to, um, you know, be authentic to my experience. And, and like you're saying, it is a really huge strength in some ways. And I find it, I, okay. I find it really funny that there is this um, stigma that is more extreme in the medical community because it's, it's just funny to me because it's almost a paradox, right? Like your physicians know that bipolar disorder is so treatable and you can live a really wonderful, healthy life with it, especially nowadays, like starting medication changed my life. Like it, it I mean, it, it's almost like magic, like, to, like how much it made my life improve and physicians know this cause they're the ones prescribing it. <laughs> so it's funny to me that they could look at, a colleague who is living with this, especially having the balls to live with it openly and somehow that being a negative thing because mm -hmm. it's, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, so mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's, that's really interesting to me. So another question that I wanted to ask you to, and that I emailed to you is, do you have physicians in your life or that you know or can reach out to who live with bipolar disorder um well before i answer that question just one thing you said you know having kind of like the balls to live openly about bipolar disorder you know i i think that's i i thought originally that it did take balls mm -hmm. um and i thought i would have to be kind of have this courageous attitude and i thought i would be facing this stigma head on and blah 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 I honestly disagree with that. And I think that it actually doesn't require this tremendous amount of courage. And I think sometimes people actually think the stigma is way worse than it really is. Yeah. Because maybe I definitely have faced some stigma, but I would say 1% of the time. Yeah. And, and so I don't think it actually requires this tremendous courageous effort. And I get people kind of telling me all the time, like, Oh, you, you must, you're so courageous in doing this. And I, I, I don't think, I don't think so. I think anybody. Yeah. Can, you know, 
and it, it really, I think we live in a different world now, you know, 2020, I think that it really is changing, you know, maybe certainly 40 or 50 years ago, it was way different and being, it, it really did require this tremendous uh, effort and courage and you would have been so, so severely stigmatized, but you know, while I only did get into one medical school, I got six interviews and that's much more than some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, so I, I just want to make sure people understand my opinion that I, I, I disagree with that yeah. respectfully. Well, um, it's, it's funny that you say that because, so I'm kind of at this tipping point where I was diagnosed uh, several years ago and basically went to a psychiatrist got evaluated it's like yeah bitch obviously bipolar disorder <laughs> like uh -huh. classic yeah. and I left and he was like I want you to start taking Lamictal okay. and I I left and was like I'm not gonna do that bye <laughs> and then for two more years lived untreated and it's only been in the last year to year and a half where I was put on actually on the uh -huh. um and actually took it put on medication and committed to a treatment plan that has been long term and been consistent mm -hmm. so it's kind of a little bit new to me that i'm taking treatment as seriously as i am and like i said my life is just a trillion times better and it it's like the way that i describe it is especially because I've had chronic suicidality since I can remember. I remember being a kid and having suicidal thoughts. Um, that's just kind of like my baseline. And obviously a lot of that ties in with untreated mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, but I describe it like getting treatment. And I remember, so I, I still do struggle with the, those kind of baseline. It's, it's a more of like a cognitive habit at this uh -huh. point where it's like you're kind of picking, it's cognitive work. Like you're picking apart the lines of thinking and everything. But I remember when my medication was kicking ass and I was going to therapy and things started to like happen for me, the suicidal feelings started to kind of subside for the first time in probably like 10 freaking years. And I described it to my therapist as it's like, somebody to, it's like if you've never seen the color blue before and somebody's like oh my god there's this color blue and they're trying to describe it to you and you're like well I don't know I can't picture that like that's a, there's no way that exists and then all of a sudden you see the color blue and that's what not being suicidal and feeling mentally well was like to me like it's like you can't even imagine it being real and then all of a sudden you see it and you're like oh my god mm -hmm. so I bring that up because it is kind of recent, I guess, that I've been really committed to treatment and even more recent that I've started to process some of the internalized shame around it, um, which I think is so common, like somehow mm -hmm. blaming yourself, like this is somehow my fault or blah, 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 all that bullshit. And um, I have started to consciously decide, okay, I want to get transparent about this. Cause I think this is what I need to feel better about it. And so I built this whole thing up in my head. Well, like, Oh my God, I'm going to tell people and they're going to be weirded out. They're going to think I'm, uh, they're going to think I'm violent. They're going to think I can't be a doctor. They're going to think this, this, and this. And kind of like you're saying, I have started, I don't want to say like, like, I guess coming out almost in a way about my mental mm -hmm. illness to my people in my program to people this wonderful family that I work for um to friends that I've had for so long that I haven't been open to, to this about every single time it's like the most amazing reaction like where people are either like oh my god like my uncle had that or like oh my god that's like so cool that you're doing so well with it like wow, you've, you have a 4.0 in school and you're like managing this illness and that's awesome. And I'm here for you if you need anything. So every single time it's like, I'm what you're talking about. Like I'm seeing, it's like putting a puzzle together. And then when the puzzle is done, you're like, oh, stigma is like 99% in my head. And yeah. I think 
a lot of it is that internalized shame that I was talking about. And that comes from, you could pick that apart in so many different ways. It's society, it's whatever, this and that. But um, well, yeah. Next, we have all these campaigns talking about stigma and I'm sure at least my therapist warned me about the stigma and it's, we always talk yeah. about stigma, stigma, stigma. We think sometimes I think it's worse than it really is. And, and my experience with stigma is yes, of course I've, I have, it, there's been a couple interactions that I've had that have not been great. It, it's fine. But you know, like that's, I think part of life. You can't expect to get along with everybody and have right. the same opinions with everybody. And the vast, vast, vast majority have been very excellent connections like you described, where I think everybody has some connection to this particular disorder, uh, bipolar disorder. Maybe they know someone or in their family, but more broad scope of, oh, my mother had depression. My cousin, you know, had suffered with uh, substance use. You know, it's just mm -hmm. so. And, and then I guess going back to your question, um, I didn't know any physicians necessarily that were open about their bipolar disorder. There was that one gentleman in the group I went to who was a radiologist who um, was didn't want to live openly. And that's his decision. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But um, there was, and I was sorry, I was typing during that, but I wanted to get the name correctly. Uh, <laughs> Dr. K. J uh, Jamson from John Hopkins University. She's not a okay. physician necessarily, but she's a therapist. I read her book. Yeah, I read her book. The Unquiet Mind. Yeah. Yes. So that, that was, was a big part of yeah. making this transition for me. And so, then because I was um, like, whoa, she got deep into it. I'm just telling people like casually in my program, like she's going into like the details of her suicide attempt. Like I can do this. Yeah. And so that was really cool to see. And then um, there was one doctor in particular that really influenced me, Dr. Vienna Manipod. Um, and so if you go on social media, she's, uh, the listeners can find her at Freud in Fashion. Um, just no spaces, no dots, Freud in Fashion. Um, and she's an osteopathic doctor down in the greater LA area. And while she doesn't have... Um, bipolar disorder. She's very open about her depression and her anxiety. Um, she talks about how, you know, she is a psychiatrist, but she goes and sees her own therapist. Um, and she really, to me, represents what, what, how a doctor should hold themselves on social media if they want to be very open on social media. Um, mm -hmm. I've been very impressed with her. And I remember reaching out to her when I was in your shoes as a pre-med student kind of asking these similar questions and she encouraged me to continue doing what I was doing and um, you know, trying to live open in public about it, even though most people don't. And um, you know, most advisors told me, I'm sure similar things to what they're telling you. Like, I don't think it's, this is a good idea for you to, to tell right. people yada, 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 but you know, fine. They, I have a different attitude. Yeah, I had, so there's actually another EMT in my program. We're the only two EMTs in the program. And he was talking to me about, um, like, maybe having some, because we're well, first responders, so there's, like, prevalence of PTSD and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about um, having PTSD symptoms, having depression symptoms, whatever, and was uh, seeking my input because I had been open about the fact that I had mental health struggles as well. And I was talking to him about it and I was like, yeah, like here's the name of somebody that I go see, you can, you know, start maybe with therapy. They might have you get evaluated. Maybe if medication is right for you, they'll, um, put you on meds. Like just, yeah, like let's, let's get you in the mental health system. And he came back to me a few days later, it was like, oh my God, Anna, I Googled um, physicians with uh, mental health. I don't know what he Googled, something about physicians and mental health. And he was like, I am so worried. They're not going to let me get a license. And they're going to, if they find out, they'll take my license. And I should have gone out of state and paid in cash. Like was saying stuff like that. So mm -hmm. when he was saying that, I was like, oh my God god people don't first of all if that even was true which it's like wildly not true no actually it is true are you serious a little bit um there is okay yeah elaborate for me you 
you know, you, when you fill out a license, you have to say, have you ever been treated for a mental illness? And, Mm -hmm. um, if you click yes, there are additional hoops. Sometimes you have to jump through. Um, sometimes that involves additional drug testing, um, evaluations. And so, yes, and certain it's a, you get your license through each state. So some states are more friendly to physicians that are open about their mental health disorder than others. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely additional hoops sometimes and, right. and annoying hoops and um, physicians sometimes have had to get their license suspended or yes, even taken away. So there actually are a big group of physicians that um, refuse to have their name used in any kind of medical document because they're afraid that a colleague could access that medical document. There's stories of physicians using pseudonyms when they go to see providers or yes, like your friend was saying, going to a different state and paying in cash. So yeah, it's, it's, a very just, fucked up system. I'm, so, mix, I'm actually utterly horrified right now. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's so, you know, I know that I'll, I'll certainly have a little bit more to speak from, from personal experience once I actually have to deal with my license. Um, for yeah. The, for the listeners, I'm a third year student, so um, I'll be working on the license um, in about a year and a half-ish. And, you know, it is what it is. It, it, I just think we can't expect the system to change and improve unless physicians start to live openly about these Mm -hmm. kind of things. And um, rather than looking at mental illness as a punitive role, looking at how can we actually help these physicians with their mental health, because there is now this growing understanding, and this is definitely a true reality that physicians are more likely to kill themselves. Oh yeah. And it's like the highest rates in any profession, isn't it? I was reading something yeah. about it, at least being in the top it's, two or three. I don't know if it's the highest, but it's definitely way up there. And yeah. you know, they always say we lose about, uh, class, like, I think it's like 400 uh, medical students mm-hmm. or uh, providers every year. It's, it's just, it's appalling. So, you know, it's, I actually, when I was in your shoes, I didn't really understand that about the whole licensing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it unfortunately is, uh, like you said, a horrific, scary truth. And you can look into certain states. And like I said, some states are better than others, but I, you're talking to me, I live in Washington and Washington is actually rated one of the worst. Is it really? Um, and so I don't, I can't speak to Kentucky. I don't really know. Um, where but, did you find out that info? Sorry to interrupt you. Where did you find out that information about well, is it basically online, the different requirements? Um, or? So there's this one, um, there's this one blogger, she's a provider, Dr. Pamela Wibble, who's kind of taken on this, this mission where she is trying to end physician and medical student suicide. And um, so she, we had this movie screening at our school um, and the documentary was about physician suicide. And so they really talked about it then how um, they're definitely, like you said, there's this additional layer of stigma in the medical community um, for providers. And, you know, I'm not going to change the way I live my life because of some stupid bullshit law in Congress and they don't understand because that's really the people that are making these laws. It's not even necessarily physicians. It's the people issuing the license and the people issuing the license aren't always, um, doctors. And, you know, I, I think they are coming from a good place. They're worried about patient safety. They, they don't want a physician who's drunk to be operating on a patient, you know, I I do think that there is certainly some valid concern here. But yeah, I mean, we shouldn't have to send doctors to other states or feel like they have to use fake names when they go to see. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah, that's really horrifying. And I didn't realize that there was that much truth to it. Yeah, Um, I mean, it's not, it's not all true. And, and, but it definitely, there's, there is a little bit of truth. Well, it's a bummer too, because I mean, he kind of slowed his role on seeking treatment and he's in a pre-med post back Like he's not even in med school yet. And he's not afraid of having some kind of record of his, which it was so upsetting to me because it's, 
I mean, PTSD is real. Depression is real. Like the risks of both of those things are death sometimes. And well, for somebody to not seek treatment and be at an elevated risk of suicide or, you know, all of the, he, he says he has a hard time sleeping. He has a hard time eating regularly. Like there, to not get treatment for a medical problem because of some kind of like fear, I guess, of that being a threat is heartbreaking. Very much so. And I would encourage your friend, um, I think it's episode five, I have on one of my friends who lives with, he's a medical student, lives with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would kind of really piggyback on what you were saying. It's look, you know, you're not even in medical school and you're worrying about your license. Like, I, I know, like, let's role. worry about the MCAT. Yeah, <laughs> How slow, about that? Slow your roll. You're not even yeah. in medical school. So yeah. don't worry about your license right now. Yeah. Because you won't get into medical school and you won't be able to handle the demands of medical school. Um, if you are living with untreated PTSD, because that can be a tremendously debilitating, um, health condition. And it's, and you know, if you think, post back is challenging you yeah. don't know what is ahead of you yeah. so you really need to get your health on point and take it serious because you know you won't be able to be as successful as you can be because if you do start to treat this properly you are going to be a tremendous physician and i have full confidence in your colleague that he can be a tremendous uh physician but you know don't don't get so far ahead of yourself, you know, in the shoes you are now, it's like, you, you can't be worrying about your license when you're not even in medical school. Yeah. And these, these laws are improving, you know, they're, people are understanding that we're losing physicians at a rapid rate to suicide. And there's already this huge physician d demand, you know, we need more physicians. So you know, I know it's kind of scary, but you, you really have to put your health first, you know, not worry about the license. It, it's you, you, and you know what, it's not like you're necessarily going to lose your license. Um, it's, you're going to lose your license if you're not treating yourself properly. If you show up to work drunk, you know, if you do all these things, it's, it, I would agree. There is truth that there, there, is going to be maybe additional hoops you have to jump through when you check that box that says, yes, I am treated for a mental health condition. But there's also arguments, and I don't necessarily endorse this, but, you know, people don't have access to your medical records unless uh, there's reason for it. So I have been personally advised, and I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't think I'm going to do this because you can Google my name and find out I have bipolar disorder. But right. people lie on those medical forms all the time. I was going to ask you about that. And people, so, like, what the you know, repercussions were. yeah. And so what I have actually been advised is people always say just, hey, click no, because then you'll have less headaches. And they can't find out if you have seeking treatment, unless something warrants it, you know, like I said, you, some, someone starts complaining about your, your judgment or your character on the job kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I, I live so openly about this, that disorder that I don't, you know, I, my mom taught me when I was five, honesty is always the best policy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I anticipate there are going to be extra hoops that I have to jump through. It's just, the price I'm going to have to pay. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise who I choose to be. Yeah. And I will say I'm a little bit. So when I first started becoming um, more open about it was probably about six months after I started getting treatment for it, maybe like four to six months. And I, so I worked, my last job was at a fire department. Um, Cause I'm an EMT and we have to get fit for, fit for duty physicals and you have to disclose all the medications you're on. You get um, like drug tested. They go through your medical records, everything. And this was the first time I'd had one of those fit for duty physicals after my diagnosis. And I was freaking the fuck out because I, it fire department and EMS world it's super macho. It's super, you don't have any problems. Suck it up. Uh, anybody who is depressed or has PTSD or like, oh, you're crazy. But you know, like there's this 
super toxic culture around it. And um, I had, I actually have one friend at the fire department. She's diagnosed with bipolar also. And she was a huge source of support for me, um, both in seeking treatment originally. She was the one who kind of pulled me aside and was like, this looks like what I have, like you're, what you're telling me. Um, but I asked her, I was like, should I, like, can they really check if this is true? Like, should I lie about it? Well, and she's like, Anna, they can't fire you for that. Like, you can't be fired for that. So I went in being like, okay, I'm just going to write my meds down. I'm going to write my diagnosis down. I'm just going to own it. I'm going to go in there. I've been great at my job up to this point. I will continue to be great at my job. And I remember we were talking about stigma being just the 1%. So this was the 1%. Uh, I met with the doctor and he was looking at my chart. He's like, why are you taking Lamictal? And I was like, well, I wrote it right there. I have a diagnosis of, of bipolar two. And he's like, I don't see this on your last fit for duty physical. And I was like, yeah, I wasn't diagnosed with it. And he's like, you're telling me you didn't have any symptoms of it. And he started to kind of grill me about it. And I was like, well, I mean, I, I had symptoms, but I just had lived with it and thought it was normal. And um, so he was grilling me about it. And then he stops and he looks at me and he goes, you don't look like you're crazy. And I was like, Oh my, this is a physician who said mm -hmm. this to me. And then he said, well, I don't know if I trust that you um, are going to be able to work on an ambulance and take care of people in such a stressful job. And I was like, guess what motherfucker I've been doing it up to this point, completely untreated. So mm -hmm. <laughs> if I can't do it treated, then I don't know how I was doing it untreated. So I had to get letters from, uh, and he, I mean, no one else has to do this for any other condition. I had to get letters from my therapist. I had to get letters from my prescriber. Um, and basically just saying Anna's stable enough to have this position. But I just thought it was so funny that I got grilled and that it became such a problem after I'd started seeking treatment but no one will say a damn word to you if you just live untreated with it and you have symptoms and people around you can see that you're suffering. No mm -hmm. one will say anything. So I got, I, after that experience, I was a little shaken up about it because I, that was my first experience with if this doctor doesn't sign my fit for duty physical, I can't work in my field here. And that means trying to go somewhere else to get a different job. And I worked for one of the best fire departments in the area. Um, that means like maybe not having a job for a little while. That mean you know what I mean? Like that was the first experience that I was like, Oh my God, like people who have influence over my life and who aren't okay with this, like this almost really affected me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like you said, totally in the minority and that's a pretty extreme specific <laughs> case yeah. and I, I understand being uh, hyper I guess conscious of first responders and their mental health because we do yeah. deal with really stressful stuff all the time um, and he, he you know I always try to give people maybe not always but I try to give him <laughs> the benefit of the doubt you know first responders are at greater risk similar to the physicians of suicide and substance issues and PTSD. So I do think he was trying to come from a place where, you know, he wanted to make sure you are just safe and you can handle this. And, you know, I, I know that must have been frustrating and annoying. And I've had similar experiences. But my favorite comeback that I always say is when people are like, oh, you don't look bipolar. And I'm like, well, the meds are working then, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and it always kind of is like, it just, yeah. it's just like a funny joke, but they're kind of like, oh, you know, like, yeah. you know, like, yeah, go fuck Bring yourself. Bring a little levity. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, like, it's fine. And, you know, I just, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but like, in, in a sense, by being open about bipolar is maybe somewhat like what people, and I don't know what your sexual orientation is, but I, I'm straight, but I, maybe it's a little bit like coming out, like you're gay sometimes, like you're just kind of bore, born with these symptoms. And so, you know, there's obviously gay people have been discriminated against 
tremendously. But if gay people weren't living to be, weren't willing to be open about their sexual orientation, then we can't anticipate that the world would ever change. Exactly. And, you know, look, like Pete Buttigieg was at least one of the top front runners for the Democratic president presidential nomination and who would have imagined that 20 years ago or you know yeah and so if if people like me and you and hopefully some of the listeners that are tuning into this conversation don't decide to live openly about their mental illness we can't we we have no right to complain about the stigma unless we're willing to do something about it and so that's how I kind of look at it and you know there's definitely going to be that won't be the last negative experience you have with this condition. It just is what it is. But I also look at it, I bet that physician is also a lot older than you. And I think it's kind of a generational thing. I think people our age are much more willing to be understanding and mm-hmm. opening and accepting of, of what we live with. Yeah. And it, it kind of made me wonder too. I was like, what, do, what does this man think that bipolar looks like? Or what does he, you know what I mean? And it kind of made me start to, again, it, it scared me, but I was also like, well, I can show people that bipolar can look like a kick-ass GPA, med school, being an amazing dog mom, being a good partner, like having a house, take, working out, taking care of my body, eating well, like I can show people that that I'm doing all of these things. Like that's what bipolar looks like over Mm -hmm. here. Like, so yeah, it was kind of, um, a little bit of a kind kind of both, both sides of it. I think I felt in that situation, but again, really not a ton of, um, stigma outside of that. I mean, if anything, I've found that it's actually brought me a lot closer to people. Um, and not even just because people like can relate like with mental illness, even like, I know I was saying, Oh, people, people will be like, yeah, my mom has this or whatever. It's more just like suddenly people feel comfortable Mm -hmm. talking about everything. I mean, I've Mm -hmm. had people be like, Oh wow. Like I want to talk to you now about how the fact that I was sexually harassed at work. Yeah. It's like, you didn't, you haven't said that to anyone, have you? It's mm-hmm. like, you know what I mean? So, and then all of a sudden the whole room is like, oh, like mm-hmm. I don't have to hide this thing anymore. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's got its pros and its cons. And that's why I love the conversation that you're having around it, because I feel like you're very honest about that. And I just love that yeah, you've said several times that you choose to live like the stigma is not a thing, mm-hmm. which I, I've, I'm trying to embrace that approach mm-hmm. more. And I've just had, so I recently told, I've been a nanny for the same family for four years now. I've, I kind of nanny part-time and I'm really close with the family and they're, again, huge part of my support system, lovely people. Um, I'm very close with the mom. She's an artist. I'm an artist. We kind of work together sometimes. And um, maybe like a month ago, I brought it up that I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder to her. And I was super nervous because I'm like, oh my God, I take care of this woman's children. Like what if she's like, oh, this, mm-hmm. I'm not going to have somebody with bipolar disorder taking care of my children. And she was so accepting whatever positive and I just saw her today actually right before getting on here and talking to you and it's International Women's Day and Mm -hmm. she said uh this store nearby her house she has um they had like a thing where you could write down a name of a woman that you think is going to change the world that you know which I think is just the sweetest thing ever Um, but she was like, yeah, I was sitting in there and I didn't know what to write. And then she, and then I thought, oh, of course my nanny. And I was like, Rebecca, that is so sweet of you to say. And she was like, well, I just think you're having the conversations that need to happen. Mm -hmm. And it was that little thing, like somebody who I've known for four years now, who had this really intimate connection with their family telling me not only like, yeah, good job, but like, you're going to change the world with Mm -hmm. that. I was like, (gasps) 
yeah, <laughs> suddenly that's a, that's I was a like, "Fantastic compliment!" And it was badass, and I was like, "Thank you." Like, so what other questions do you have? Uh, you know, that I can help you. You know, gain acceptance to medical school or or yeah. whatever. So, do you still have? The, I mean, I know everybody kind of has these, but do you have like the like bipolar bad days still? And if you do, do they, do you feel like it, um, like how does that affect your experience at med school? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the symptoms are less severe, of course, than they were, but definitely, I mean, you're never going to start having bad days. And there's some days that I don't feel like studying. There's some days that I don't feel as into trying to you know because right now i'm a third year interacting with patients but you know i think everybody also kind of has those those days and you know you just have to kind of take it in stride and i always try to think of you know this emotional experience kind of like the ocean you know there's going to be some some good tides some bad and you just have to kind of ride it out and you know medical school is is really really challenging and sometimes you're just going to have to push through those those days, but also, you know, take advantage of the days where you are feeling really energized, really good, and you can study and go ham. But then there's just going to be some days where you're going to not be as productive as you would hope. And you, you have to try your best and just, you know, that's all you can really do. Um, you know, but that being said, I've also had days that are really good and, and really amazing days. And I've even had some days where I've been probably a little bit manic. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember there was one time that I was like dancing like crazy before we had this test and everyone thought I was a little manic and I probably was, but I was trying to just almost brighten the mood of our school because every, it was during finals week and everyone was so depressed. So I just brought my boom box to school mm -hmm. and blasted it in the, the hallways and kind of got in trouble, but it was fun <laughs> and fine. And, um, you know, it, it was all good. And it was kind of like that, the running joke for the rest of medical school. So, yeah. you know, the, you're never going to stop really being bipolar. You're going to figure out ways to cope better, but you know, it's right now I, I take a uh, Depakote, you know, a very common med for bipolar disorder and it's working for me now, but I don't know if it's going to work forever. And like you said, you're taking Lamictal and I'm glad it's working, but it's, it's possible that you will have to change that course of treatment in the future. You know, these, these, this disorder we live with is, it fluctuates and, you know, you just have to, it's, you're never going to be cured. You're never going to figure it all out, but you know, it definitely, it's, it will, of course, will create a challenge for you in medical school, but I also sometimes think it creates a strength as well because everyone's under so much stress, but prior to entering medical school, as you've already learned all these tools through your therapist and really how to cope with stress. You've seen, of course, some some probably pretty horrific scenes as a EMT and you've learned ways to, to process that. And, you know, you're going to have to use those same skills in medical school. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, okay. So when it comes to coping, both like preventative coping, because obviously there's things that you kind of do, like I call it the uh, mental health multivitamin, like working out, um, getting enough sleep, all of the, the, foundation of good mental health beyond that though were there any coping skills that you found that you developed after going into med school that were maybe um influenced by that context of being in med school or did it was it pretty much the same like just keep your good strong foundation do your tried and true coping mechanisms like, how did you oh, cope? I like, mean, more I, work, more school, more lecture yeah, time? Yeah, it's, it's definitely way different. And I, I had to learn different lessons because, you know, I thought studying for the MCAT was hard and then you get punched in the face by medical school and you realize that it was nothing compared. Right. Um, I'm sure you've heard that many times before. So I've definitely kind of expanded on some of the coping mechanisms that I knew were always so important. Um, like, I always knew exercise was really important. Um, sleep, like all the things you just said. But, you know, when you get into medical school, you just time is your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And so I like, you know, kind of taking my time with working out, lifting and, and really playing basketball, sometimes having really long uh, cycling rides and stuff. And 
and that's always just not feasible in medical school. You know, sometimes you have 20 minutes to work out and that's it. Right. And so learning, learning that, but you know, also really, I've learned that I, I don't want to sacrifice my hobbies in medical school. And, you know, it's, it sounds dorky, but like golf has been one of my best tools in medical school. And, you know, I would always try to, in a sense, treat myself to golf maybe once a week um, as kind of like my stress relief. And I think one thing that I did very well in medical school that actually led me to be more productive is I would budget time during my week and plan for it every week because these are going to be my six hours or even a whole day. And that's what I would really strive for where I am not going to be a medical school that or a medical student that day. I'm just going to mm -hmm. focus on being a, a normal human. I just want to be a husband. I just want to be a dog owner. Like you said, a golfer. And I call myself a YouTube mechanic, you know, and just <laughs> like, I don't, because I think if you try to be a medical student 100% of the time, you're going to just fall and trip on your face. And, you know, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow because I, I struggled in medical school academically and I almost failed a couple courses. So you think the solution to that is study more, study more, study more. And I, at first, that's what I was doing. I was studying so tremendously and just killing myself. And I realized my sleep was getting impacted my overall moods were just going to shit. And then I wouldn't be as productive when I studied because I just, I, I hated it and I was forcing myself to do it. So I learned actually taking a, every Saturday off where I would just, you know, that would be my golf day. That would be my time with my wife or dog or whatever. And then I would hit it hard on Sunday. It actually led me to be a much better student too. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so it sounds like you do still make that time to you have to clear your brain out a little bit mm -hmm. yeah um yeah and that's the thing too especially being I mean you're you were a non-traditional student I'm a non-traditional student there are we had lives before <laughs> medical school whereas a lot of people that I'll be starting medical school with went through high school went through college going into med school haven't had those experiences so like I do I have a lot of other hobbies like I love to paint and draw I love to work out I love to do this and do that and um yeah like you're saying especially for anyone listening sometimes your best like even right before a test I'm not studying sometimes even up to 24 hours before a test I'm not studying anymore like I'm sleeping I'm eating well I'm going outside and I'm I'm kind of getting my my brain relaxed to take the test where it's I've done my studying if I know it I know it <laughs> by this mm -hmm. point and then I'm going in with a, a well-rested brain um I did have another question for you but now I'm kind of blanking out on it related to med school um so you're going into psychiatry Yes. And you, you've done your psychiatry rotation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And it was everything you hoped and dreamed it would be? I mean, yes and no. I mean, the, there, was, there was certainly some areas of the rotation that um, I didn't like. Um, and, you know, there's, there's going to be, there's just, sometimes you just disagree with what the physician does. And but it still was very confirming for me that like, you know, I do want to go into this. And, you know, it, it was kind of a very surreal moment. I remember the first day because it was really the first time. It was just weird being in, you know, I remember the psych ward as a patient. And now it's like I felt like I was almost sitting on the other side of the psych ward, mm -hmm. you know, as kind of in a provider role, not as, not of course, as a full physician, but damn near close. And, you know, it, it was very, very emotional for me. I remember that first day. In, in not a bad way, though. It just was like, holy shit, like I've kind of, this is, it feels almost full circle at this point. Um, and, you know, but it, it's, it's, no, it wasn't everything I necessarily hoped and dreamed um, because it's, it's very emotionally taxing. And one thing I know that I'm going to struggle with, um, and I think all aspects of medicine people struggle with, is, is leaving it at work. You know, I would find myself thinking about, the patients, particularly in psychiatry, when I was at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
I know that's, I'm just going to have to, to get better and balance at that. Cause I don't even necessarily think that's always a bad thing, but it can be very co overly consuming and it start to interfere maybe with my home life and my own wellness. And it's like finding that balance of being able to leave your work stress at work and, and, you know, being able to function at home is definitely something that's going to be challenging because, you know, being in the world of psychiatry, it's very, very emotionally charged and heavy. Right. Yeah. My boyfriend and I are both first responders. So our house, we come home and it's like, we're, it's, we're relaxing now. This is, this is it. We can talk about what we need to talk about, but we're going to kind of seal it talk about it, seal it, and then just enjoy each other's company. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel, because obviously psychiatry, I mean, medicine is pretty much, that's the front, like uh, prescribing medication is your first line as the psychiatrist. Did you feel limited by um, like people like so say you have somebody come in and there's like a really profound underlying issue like uh homelessness or something um which is like yeah anybody would be depressed in that situation like how do you think and this is just something because i've been thinking about psychiatry as well and i've been kind of grappling with that question of like where what is your role there like where where do you enter into treatment for that patient you know, it's like, whereas as medication is obviously not going to cure the, the root issue of like, for example, homelessness. Yeah, I mean, and there's certainly no easy answer to that. But, you know, there, the approach to psychiatry in most of the places that I've been exposed to is, you know, it really is a treatment team. You know, there's the therapist, but then also kind of like a caseworker that does at least try to assist them the best they can with trying to get that person out of homelessness, maybe into some sort of facility or shelter. Um, but yeah, it is, it is going to be tremendously, tremendously hard. And, you know, definitely there's going to be times where there, sometimes people get discharged right back to where they came from on the street. Yeah. And it's, it's very, very challenging. And, um, you know, th there's definitely no easy answer to that. And, and sometimes that's what's, it's very frustrating in psychiatry. There's going to be a lot of things outside of your control that, uh, you know, there's no easy answer to. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah. Um, do you have any kind of blanket advice for all of our uh, pre-meds, maybe even particularly non-traditional pre-meds who are going into it and living with some type of mental health diagnosis and starting this whole journey? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, and, and one of my buddies and I, we wrote a book on um, medical students who live with uh, mental health issues. And it's, it's basically based on this podcast, the first like 10 episodes or so, but you can find that book on Amazon, just search um, Imperfect Balance or Logan Noon, you can find it. Um, and because I, I just remember, I think a lot of pre-meds think that mental health conditions are going to be the reason they don't get in. And, you know, I, I really, really disagree with that. I think that there's a lot of successful medical students who do live with mental health conditions, whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. You know, I think everybody deals with some kind of mental health challenge in medical school, you know, whether that's dealing with depression or bipolar disorder like us, or, you know, just trying to be a mother or father while balancing medical school, you know, it's, it's challenging nonetheless. And mm -hmm. so just, I would say, don't let that hold you back um, in thinking you're not capable. Um, so I guess, you know, and also the, the, pre-med years podcast, the way you really found me, I think one of the best lessons he taught me is, is, you know, applying to medical school is so much more than simply checking off boxes on your resume or hitting that perfect score on your MCAT that you want. You know, there's, it, it's so much more, you know, try to think of like, why are you a unique applicant? Why are you going to be a great physician rather than just trying to be the smartest person in the room or have the most broad basis of experiences or the most publications or whatever, you know, cause all that's bullshit. 
Um, right. And, you know, I think some medical schools approach um, applications though differently. You know, I applied to both allopathic and osteopathic schools and, you know, who really knows, but I only got selected for interviews at osteopathic schools. Um, so, you know, I, I really, for any of the pre-meds out there that think like osteopathic education might be inferior, you know, I, I would disagree with that. You know, yeah, I, took, that's bullshit. I, I ended up taking the same board exams that yeah. an allopathic student does, you know, so while I will have different letters after my name, I took the same set of boards exams. Um, and so I, I just, we need more physicians out there that are, have same attitudes to me and you that are, are willing to talk about these kind of issues. So I really encourage students out there that are interested in becoming a provider, um, that it's okay to live openly about your mental health condition and, and you can handle this. Do you have classmates that you talk to who also are Very in much the... so. Really? Much so. Cool. The first, like I said, that book that me and my buddy made, the first 10 episodes, none of those were through Skype or Zoom or whatever we're using right oh, now. Oh, it was all people that you... It was, all, it was all classmates of mine. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, so it was, you know, uh, in one of the things I've been very blessed with is, you know, when I entered medical school, I was very, very open about um, my diagnosis and my experiences and, and kind of similar to what you were saying, that openness led people to start approaching me and say, oh, I have depression, I have PTSD. And I met so many people that had experiences that I was like, oh my God, you know, I, I want to help them share their stories. And that was really the impetus to start this podcast. Did you find um, that same fear in students who were, you know what I mean? Like, did you find that students who were disclosing that to you maybe hadn't because they were nervous about being judged or stigmatized? Certainly. And, and some students chose to remain anonymous in sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that's an effective way to help people out. You know, I'm not dissing that by any means. Um, right. I, I choose to be fully open just because I, I just think it's easier. I do think it, it can have more of an impact when there is an actual name and person attached to a story. Um, but, but that aside, you know, if, if someone wants to share their story, uh, with being anonymous, you know, it is what it is. And I still think it, it's going to have a very positive impact on, on an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really happy that I found you because it really, it, it means a lot to have somebody who's actually living openly. And, um, like I said, there's not a lot of visibility in the medical community, especially around bipolar disorder and it's just like anything it's when you have any type of representation groups are going to feel more like they can they can do it too yeah so it's been that was kind of my mission is to find people who are doing it and then that's when I was like ah shit I think I have to do it too <laughs> I think I have to be the physician that I'm looking for so I that think, maybe yeah I think that's future, excellent some future doctor maybe will be like, oh, I'll go talk to her and she can give me advice about it because that's what I've been looking for and it's been hard to find. And you said, I wrote down a couple names, um, Dr. Pamela Wibble, um, Dr. Vienna. Uh, uh, man Manipod. Um, okay. But if you go on, um, I know you're off social media, like you were saying, but if I you know go, if you go, she's very, um, um, present on like social media. So she's at Freud and fashion. She does host a blog. I don't know how much she still blogs. Um, but, it, but she was actually really one of the best influences on my life to, to try to go after this, um, at least as openly as I am. Um, but yeah, thank, I mean, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to get, um, you know, a listener that I, I feel like I, I actually had an impact on and, and really helped. So, you know, thank oh, you hugely. so much. Um, you know, it, it really, the, the seeing the podcast numbers grow only, ha only makes me feel so good. Um, but, you know, getting, getting a letter and actual feedback like that just has 
such a tremendous impact on me and it, it motivates me to continue down this path. And so thank you so much. Um, you know, if you have other questions, please, um, you know, maybe we can do a follow up episode further along. You know, I, I really hope you gain entrance into medical school and, and please let me know how I can help. Yeah. My therapist, um, I told her, obviously I told her about you, like when this, how the whole conversation came up and, um, she was like, Oh yeah, I'm going to write this person's name down because there are other people who like, she has clients who are looking for this type of visibility. Mm -hmm. So shout out to my therapist, Alyssa, you're the cool. bomb. Great. <laughs> but she, awesome. Yeah. So she's definitely uh, plugging you left and right. Probably she's probably plugging you right now. <laughs> well, I'll have to I'll have to look because with the the listeners of the podcast, you can see where their geographic location is. If there's Seriously? a big if there's a big bump out of Louisville, I'll uh, I'll, I'll yeah. definitely think of you and your therapist. So thank you. Kentucky's so much. about to blow up over here. Yes. Yes. I I have not <laughs> been to Kentucky, but if I'm ever in the area, I'll be sure to give you a call. Please do. Kentucky's don't believe what you hear about Kentucky. It's a lovely place. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll be sure to try. I want to go to Kentucky and try some bourbon. So that'll be that sounds great uh, to me. We have that here. Yeah. Very bourbon good. and horses. That's oh. we have a lot of bourbon and horses. Fantastic. Well, cool. Well, Anna, it's been great talking to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And uh, yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much, Logan. Seriously, super appreciate you. You've been very motivating along my journey. All right. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, nice. Well, have a good day. Yeah. Take care, Logan. Bye. All right. Take it easy.